Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good afternoon. It's glad to see you in such numbers after the lunch. It's always the most difficult part of the day. But eating makes us happy like living in the smart city. You know what was the goal of Dubai government when they have uh, awarded to be the uh, pilot experiment of smart and sustainable city? They set up as a goal to make the city with the happiest people in the world. And now if you go to Dubai, you will find the happiness machines everywhere where you can tell how happy are you with all aspects, with all kinds of activities that make city smart. And they measure, they call it index of happiness, and it's one of the most valued parameters in their evaluation, how far they, they got and what else has to, be, has to be done in order to become the city of happiest people in the world. Of course, concept of smart city was introduced by ITU, International Telecommunication Union, although it is, it is much wider than just telecommunications. Information and communication technologies are in the heart. It's kind of a nervous, nervous system of the, of the smart, sustainable city. And then smart city is about social welfare, about governing, about transport, about health, and about many education and about many, many other things that can make people happy. But since telecommunications is in the middle and nothing can be done without telecommunications, we decided to start our presentation today with telecommunications. So, Tony Gray, who is chairman, who is a CEO of the TCCA, and the TCCA is the Critical Communication Association, he is going to tell a few words about 5G. Quite an interesting topic, and I expect many questions after his presentation. Tony, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Miladin, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm not going to give you the TCCA introductory message. I'm sure a lot of you know who is TCCA. Some of you are even members. If you have any doubts, Miladin's the chairman. I'm the CEO. We have a booth up in the exhibition, so come and talk to us. So, 5G. Um, stand by for lies, half-truths, and conjecture. It's not here yet, but uh, what is it intended to be, and what might, in inverted commas, it do for PPDR? Because, of course, we don't know yet. Um, oh, what have I done, Mr. AV man? Oops, good start. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. That kills it, right. Okay, excellent. So I'll try to only press one button and so on. So, couple of glib facetious arguments for you, what is it? Uh, nobody exactly knows yet. It's not finished yet, it's not done yet, so therefore we definitely know it's the next generation after 4G. But beyond that, we don't know so much. Equally, what might it do for PPDR? Nobody exactly knows yet. But definitely the expectation, and particularly the hype, is growing. I went recently to Mobile World Congress, this huge festival of mobile every year in Barcelona, and everything was 5G, we're doing 5G, we have 5G, we've done 5G, where's 6G? And when you scratch the surface, there was very little underneath that, and, but the logo flies and I proudly wear it and so do many others. So being more serious, um, 5G is a brand new mobile technology, not simply 4G on steroids, it's much more than that. It, it supports a brand new radio technology called, surprisingly, NR, for new radio. Um, and a lot more different and mainly higher spectrum bands, uh, which can lead to increased speed and capacity and reduced delay, or so-called latency. There's new core technology coming for 5G, and that will incorporate things like edge computing, doing the computing work right out at the edge of the network, rather in the, the core in the middle. Um, things like network slicing, where you can slice up the, the functionality of the network according to the end user uh, requirement. Again, a new concept in 5G. 
and a new architecture, flatter, more seamless, um, and with more standardized interconnections that just makes 5G much uh, lighter, as it were, in terms of the infrastructure, and therefore the sort of speeds of transition of, of information through the network and so on. The four fundamentals that we can define right now for 5G is the bandwidth is expected to reach up to at least one gigabit. You'll read 10 gigabits or you'll read even 100 gigabits, but in my practical and realistic mind, we can certainly say one gigabit per second over a mobile phone type link, which in itself is pretty amazing. Latency, the delay end-to-end -end between signals, is expected to be one millisecond or even less. And for example, when we talk about uh, push-to-talk requirements, we talk about needing 10, 15, even 30 milliseconds being entirely acceptable as a delay. So one millisecond is, again, something remarkable. It will be more energy efficient. The devices will consume less power, which will mean longer battery life. And for example, for massive Internet of Things, devices out there entirely unattended and, and alone, this will mean that the devices will be able to survive on the internal battery for very much longer. Again, network capacity will be significantly increased to accommodate those millions and billions of concurrent devices. And again, that's a function of the capacity of the overall network based on the sorts of frequencies that are being used, the numbers of, of uh, base stations or enode Bs or whatever 5G enode Bs are going to be called, the, the number of those dispersed across the network. So it's fairly dramatic. And what's it for? Um, this is a standard diagram that gets put up a lot. It, it's actually derived from the ITU uh, IMT 2020 um, usage definitions. And it's against this sort of concept of operations that 3GPP will be submitting its bid to provide the standard for 5G into ITU really quite soon. So for example, at the top, enhanced mobile broadband. That's, an, and then massive machine type communications, this internet of super many things everywhere and, and, and everything reporting back over common networks. And finally, but by no means least, ultra reliable and low latency communications. And you can see, or you might be able to see, if you can gaze at that for long enough, all the subsequent elements of gigabits in a second, 3D video and UHD screens, work and play in the cloud, augmented reality, industry automation, self-driving cars, mission critical applications, which is where we in TCCA come in and take interest. But by no means least, in the bottom left there, the thing we're here to talk to about today, smart cities. So what might 5G do for PPDR, Public Protection and Disaster Relief? Well, that's very much an open question because it's chicken and egg. We don't have 5G yet, so we don't really know what it can do. We know what we'd like, maybe, for it to do, but again, not enough thinking has happened yet about what the use cases for 5G is or will be, and it'll be an iterative process inevitably. But so again, if we refer back to this ITU triangle of, of capabilities, we think about enhanced mobile broadband, well, that was the initial driver for the work in 4G that TCCA and others have been heavily involved in for the last six or seven years in 3GPP. So that's just an extension of what's already being done and, and has been done in 4G for mission-critical applications like MCPTT, 
MC Data, MC Video, which are all 3GPP standards that are available right now and being developed into usable equipment as we speak. If we look at the ultra-reliable and low-latency aspects, well, that encompasses future capabilities like AI, like automatic face recognition, like drones, and like maybe even satellite communications coming into the mix, uh, which are all future capabilities potentially of interest to the mission-critical community. So when can you have it? And should you wait until you can have it? When? Um, in terms of standards, and I stress only standards, the paper definitions of what 5G should be, about the end of 2020 is when 3GPP is planning to have the first 5G standards available. Based on that, somewhere around 2022, uh, some first release um, brand new equipments based on those new standards might become available. And on that, 2025, commercial deployments might become available. Now, you might say, well, but you just said you were in Barcelona and everyone in Mobile, Congress, Mo Mobile World Congress, including some operators, were saying, we've got 5G. Well, they haven't. They've got 4 point something G and they may have implemented some early element of this new radio aspect that I talked about, but they don't have many at all devices, maybe one or two, and they certainly don't have deployments that are out there providing commercial service. So being realistic, let's say something around 2025. Wait, should you wait? Absolutely no, I would say. <laughs> if you need something now, why are you going to wait until the new Super Wizzo extra fast, extra sexy one comes along? Um, as I mentioned, the 4G LTE Advanced MCX standard suite is substantially complete and beginning to be implemented, and that will provide over 4G mission-critical push-to-talk, mission-critical data, mission-critical video for use of mission-critical applications. Um, and you didn't sit waiting to say, I need a computer, and I need it now. I need to be able to do Excel, Word. I need to be able to send off my uh, five minutes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I need to be able to send off my reports, blah, blah, blah. But there's a new Intel processor coming in five years. I'll wait for that. No, don't wait, please. Um, in any, any case, the narrow band standards, Tetra and so on, and the coming 4G broadband solutions will become the de facto standard for PPDR literally for decades, beyond my lifetime, I somehow expect. Ask me back in 25 years and I'll tell you if I was right. But so, no point in waiting for 5G use all the capabilities of, of narrowband and 4G to do everything you need to do in PPDR. Um, and these MCX standards that I keep talking about will automatically, as is the way of, of 3GPP, feed forward into ultimate 5G versions of the same thing. There's a timeline which I won't bore you with too much. This is a classic 3GPP, when can I have it? type timeline, um, phase one of 5G, which was actually this new radio bit only, uh, came out, will come out mid this year. Um, release 16 is being worked on and is predicted for mid 2020, and then mid 2021 release 17, which is just the ongoing extension. So those two phases of 5G work, release 15, primarily, as I say, about new radio, Release 16 completes the, the presentation that 3GPP will make to IMT 2020 to ITUR and hopefully will become the de facto global standard for 5G. These are only standards. Again, I stress again, 
um, you always have to allow something like 9 to 18 months for what's called standards to silicon. So in other words, getting the paper into kit that you can actually play with and use. In conclusion, in terms of timescales, as I said, by the end of 2020, we should have some standards for vendors to start beginning development on. Around about 2022, therefore, some first equipment could start to become available. And let's say 25, some full commercial deployments could become uh, available. A lot depends on equipment, particularly devices, of course. Um, it's one thing developing infrastructures, but device manufacturers who are going to be developing and, and delivering in billions need time to understand the market and to develop chipsets and so on. In closing, to quote the economic forum, the World Economic Forum, economists expect the global economic impact of 5G in new goods and services will reach 12 trillion US dollars by 2035 as 5G moves mobile technology from connecting people to people and information towards connecting people to everything. And on that note, I would suggest at 5G, we never need a 6G, but we probably will. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I think it was quite quite right measure. It was quite clear, not too technical. So <laughs> everybody, I think, could, knows more than, than we know before about 5G. And now I'm expecting your questions from the audience. Please introduce yourself and then ask the question. I'm in Beresford 999112 Liaison Committee from the UK. Um, do you think the blacklisting of Hawaii, yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't got the pronunciation correctly, mm. will delay the introduction of 5G? I frankly doubt it. I'm not the expert, but personally, I think there's more initiative and, and more impetus behind 5G globally than the sort of individual incidents like that could possibly have too much influence over. Um, uh, 3GPP itself, which of course is, is the starting point of the standards for all these things, is so global and so inclusive that uh, very little stops the, 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 the roller track that is 3GPP just getting ahead. More questions? Yes, we have a gentleman over there. I'm nervous because I saw Fidel at the back, and Fidel asks difficult <laughs> questions. <laughs> so, good afternoon. My good name afternoon. is Antonio Crispo for Hyundai Motor Europe. Uh, I have uh, one question. If my company wants to develop a uh, modem for his uh, device, like e-call or also telematics, uh, I have to start now. You put in your presentation 2025 is more or less the timing. It will be commercial one. Mm. Are you sure about this? Because um, <laughs> no. <laughs> the carrier like Vodafone, Orange, Telefonica, and so on are the main actor of the deploy of 5G, not yeah. only Ericsson or Huawei and so on. Yeah. And um, for my impression, their goal is different from the other people because the goal is probably smartphone selling or data card selling, yeah. and probably they want to, to deploy the 5G maybe in the main city, like maybe New York or uh, Berlin or Frankfurt and so on, yeah. and put the rural zone where my company is more interesting uh, to have uh, the car that is driving this rural zone, mm. will be covered from where? Mm. From which kind of technology? 4G? 2G? Mm. 3G? 2G? 3G will be cut off soon, maybe mm. 2025, 3G? Yeah. And my question is definitely 5G, how much would be useful for my for automotive point of view? Yeah. Yeah, well, and first let me say no, I'm not confident about anything I said, except perhaps the green bar that I showed you, which is 3GPP's published 
timeline for releases and they pretty much stick to those. Um, but I've gone back to first principles with my predictions because history shows us that certainly just having a new release doesn't mean you've got any usable equipment. It takes nine to 18 months before industry's had a chance to take those paper uh, standards and start developing them into uh, usable equipment. And, and look at the experience we've had uh, as TCCA in 3GPP just pursuing the mission critical features, mission critical push to talk, mission critical video, mission critical data. That started six years ago. We had the start of usable standards two years ago and now we're doing plug tests between 100 or so different vendors to try to prove that their uh, first efforts of, of uh, prototype equipment actually work with each other. So, but I, I'm fully aware that timelines can be fast-tracked if there's a particular commercial driver, and let's face it, that's always the thing that's, that's driving these things. So if, if a particular operator or a particular application suddenly became to look so valuable and could only be delivered using 5G, then I expect my timelines would be contracted a bit. I think perhaps the question back to you is, does your application strictly need 5G or could it not use available 4G? And that's a question to ask yourself rather than me. <laughs> if, I, if I may add, uh, during the standardization process in 3GPP, they have allowed for several ways of approaching 5G and implementing 5G. Just because of the companies who want to make quick breakthrough at the market and uh, advertise themselves uh, as having 5G. The 5G that is offered now by Korea Telecom, for example, with few types of Samsung phones, is not at all the 5G that is going to be the ultimate goal as of, of 3GPP standardization. First, it doesn't go in the frequencies that were promised, and only very high frequencies of 20 more uh, uh, gigahertz can give you the bandwidth which can guarantee all these features of 5G, meaning uh, low latency, huge bandwidth, a lot of data. Uh, what 5G, the, those implementations that are announced today, it's all signaling. Everything is done via LTE and it's just a new radio that is implemented and in much lower bands than are going to be expected because it's not just about chipsets and it's about antennas, it's about new towers, it's about coverage because the higher you go, the, uh, it's difficult to obtain the coverage, so the complete, it's about uh, uh, network slicing, it's about uh, using all available sources, it's about your mobile phones being relaying the 5G signal and, and being uh, transmitters as well. So it's completely different philosophy. When to reach this, I even think 2025 is too optimistic. So I, I fully agree with you, whoever wants to implement something, especially in critical communications area, which is public protection and disaster relief, and which we're all here for, just go now and do it with uh, LT Advanced Pro, and 5G will come. But for many years will be logical continuation of what we are talking and seeing now as 4G. That's my, my personal opinion. Thanks a lot. I think that that's it. Uh, if there are some more questions, uh, Mr. Gray is available at TCCA booth there, so please feel free and, and ask the questions. We have to proceed now. And I'm going to, <clears throat> to invite Mr. Eric White, Global Chief Technology Officer for Mission Critical System from Atos. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about the impacts of new technologies, about connected police officers, about Internet of Things, and the other hot topics. So I'm not going to steal your time. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mladen. Hi, everyone. So I'm Eric Vaid. I'm based in France. I'm CTO in an entity called Mission Critical System within, um, within Atos. And I'm in charge of product offering and strategy. Um, first question, who is Atos? 
uh, many people know with Atos. Atos is a worldwide company leader in digital, digital transformation. We are not only an IT integrator, we, pro we produce and build products and solutions, high processing calculation, and edge, ser edge servers, critical communications and solution, command control and intelligence, and uh, technologies for safety. We operate under four brands, Atos, which is the major brand, Unify, which is unified communication, Sintel, which is mostly time and material, and Worldline, which is e-payment. Um, we have worldwide reference in these domains, and we are, like you see, worldwide IT partner for the Olympic and Paralympic Games since about 20 years. Cities are becoming safer. We often talk about smart cities and their major domains, but behind these domains, words are hiding new trends, new challenges. New sensors, a bunch of new data, new networks, new storage impacts, new services, and new usages. One of the major questions to be asked, what if smarter meant safer? Could we transform what we're building to, to a safer world? Building a smart city is not so easy. Um, we have identified four, five major challenges, but there are many more. Regarding the sites, the size of the, uh, of the city, the impact of installing sensors is not the same. How many cities installed CCTV and video rooms and now are thinking to add on intelligence, think on the network problems? This is one example. There are many more. When we're talk talking about digital security, the main questions are how to secure IoT? How is data protected? Are the networks secured enough? From a legal perspective, uh, new laws are being thought, voted, and each region has its own specificities. In terms of secure, oh, sorry. In terms of secured connectivity, we talk about LTE, private network, 4G, 5G to come. Uh, and questions, are we able to share all data to all vertical solutions? This is one of the major challenges. And the last one is for citizens. Citizens are asking more and more questions. What is done with my data? Where is it stored, processed? Are there any risks regarding my person and my family to come? To come back to public safety, what should be the police officer, the fireman, firefighters of the future? There are five big domains. Tomorrow you could say that a police officer or a firefighter will be automatic and intelligent. He will have connected helmets, connected with wearables. He will have a bracelet, watches, drones, anything that will give him information about who he is, what he does. The second point is based on context. There will be more drones, more information, incidents coming from different types of sensors health via IoT, smartwatches, and things like these, social media, and um, uh, smartphones. In terms of connected, collaborative, and interoperable, the safety forces will be able to communicate if more effectively with mission-critical solutions like push-to-talk, video, multicast, and things like these. New tech worlds will have real information come on open source app and app, apps too. And the last point regarding unified and immediate, it means command and control. We'll have a change in the way of acting. More and more data will come to the headquarters and will be, I would say, in an ultra connectivity mode, we'll, we'll have to, I would say, select data and give the information to firefighters and police officers. One major point is about innovation. We're at one time at that innovation is changing every day. We can talk about today, but tomorrow will be another problem. Um, the question, how to integrate this technical, uh, this, this element in the technical platform. As I heard this morning in the uh, track about cloud and smart cities, uh, the idea is to how to gather all this information to provide a smart city. Atos has built a solution based on fireware, so it's an open source solution that permits to, I would say, collect the information, process the information, and transfer the information to all the verticals regarding the smart city. Um, sorry. 
I will give an example. So, imagine there is a terrorist attack. We will not be able to see in the first time there's a terrorist, but we'll, we will manage to understand that somebody is screaming or a gunshot. We will manage to see that somebody is running. So we'll identify a problem and know that somebody is risky, there's an incident. In this thing, we can, in, with smart mobility, in flu, in the direction saying, on the right side, there's a danger, on the green side, it's safety. So the idea is to say, combining sound, image, movement will change a little bit the way of working and the way of smart cities tomorrow. Um, I will talk about a return of experience of the city of Marseille and the city of Nice. Uh, the local police asked us to uh, provide, um, no, they wanted to demonstrate the interest of IoT and critical communication for public safety and security forces, for day-to-day -day work. The idea was to provide in real time to field officers and headquarters a powerful picture of the city streets in order to better react to situation and have and take the good decision. So the idea was to give multicast uh, solution, push to talk video and things like this, and give real time information of what is going on. The practical example of the deployment, taking for account a public network and a private 4G LTE network, the idea was to collect data coming from drones, coming from wearables, coming from uh, smartphones, and the idea was to process everything and give the information to the police officer at real time. In addition, the idea was to have, I would say, real-time information linked to CCTV and work with edge computing on data processing and give information on what is going on, follow people, and understand what is going on. In terms of conclusion, what could we say? Building a smart or safe city is a challenge. There is a need to define a good strategy, a budget, plan technology and usages. We cannot dissociate technology and usage. The second part is building a smart, safe city requests to ask questions about secured core networks. Uh, like we are hearing, tomorrow the challenges of gathering more information, processing all this information will be necessary and will change a little bit the way of acting, the way of storing data and the way of processing. And the last point is measuring performance in progress. When you build a solution, you build it for citizens. So you'll have to, to measure the performance and the progress of satisfaction, but not only of the citizens, but equally of these officers. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Eric very much. I didn't have to show these cards. Thank you for timekeeping and for an interesting and informative presentation. Now please stay. Uh, let me see if we have some questions related to what we have heard now. Any question, comment, idea? Hi, everyone, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please, go. <laughs> um, does any of what you've spoken about, is, is that all predicated on there being 5G bearer, or can some of it be done now with 4G? Hello. It actually works for cities like uh, City of Marseille, no. City of Nice, Eindhoven. It, it actually works, so we do not have to wait for 5G, actually. Good. Don't wait. So, <laughs> the message is clear and <laughs> confirmed and proven. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other question? No? Well, thanks again to Eric. Thank you. I know it was not very polite from us to leave the lady for the end, but the sweets come at the end. So I, I'm sure that we are going to enjoy in presentation of Michelle Wetterwald. She is from the company Natalani, but I understand that she is going more to talk about her work and their support to in, in uh, MTEL Etsy. ETSI stands for European Telecommunication Standard Institute and EMTEL stands for Emergency Telecommunications. So the rest we will hear from Michelle. Please, the floor is yours. 
Okay, thank you very much for this nice introduction. So my name is Michel Vetterwald. I'm working in a small company and uh, I'm representing here uh, a small project uh, uh, we have done for MTEL for uh, a study of use cases and communications involving IoT devices in emergency communications. Um, so uh, my presentation will, uh, first I will present the motivation of the work then um, uh, the objective and the presentation of the project uh, very shortly. I will focus more on the use cases we have analyzed and the recommendation for requirements to future standardization uh, documents. And I will conclude my talk with some comments. So, um, okay. What is, uh, what is the motivation of uh, this work? Uh, we all know that the internet has matured. We have seen the emergence of Internet of Things. We are now, as it was said before, we are now interconnecting people and objects across private, public, and industrial spaces. Um, IoT includes devices, but also sensors and essentially smart services and applications. Uh, from a, a former project where we studied the uh, standardization landscape of IoT, we realized that uh, IoT is not only connectivity and communication systems, but it is also integration and interoperability, deployment of infrastructure, the devices and the sensor technologies, and security and privacy, so it is much wider. Um, we all know that IoT is invading our, our daily lives, but uh, uh, as uh, uh, emergency services uh, uh, representatives or uh, persons involved, you all know that it is also invading relevant uh, uh, services uh, in emergency situations. Uh, then we made the consideration that there are no uh, uh, such requirements for communications involving IoT devices in emergency situations which have been standardized. So we, we started uh, this uh, standardization project by uh, um, uh, we, the objective to uh, deliver a technical report uh, to prepare for the requirements for communications so involving IoT, invo IoT devices in all types of emergency uh, situations. So far, MTEL has considered uh, mainly individuals in three types, of three types of communications, emergency calling, mission critical communication, and public warning system. Our objective was to provide a fail-safe environment to involve and benefit from IoT devices. And you see here on the screen some of these benefits like uh, uh, no human interaction, no need to translate in human languages, uh, real-time operation or, or, or full-time operation seven hours and 20, uh, seven days per 24 hours. Our deliverable is a technical report. We are uh, almost finished it. It will be published at the end of June. Um, I have 15 minutes today to give you some results. The, the, the report is about 100 pages, so I will go uh, briefly on some examples taken from the report. Uh, something important is that this report and this uh, project has been performed under the umbrella of uh, Steering co Special Committee MTEL at Etsy. So here you have a list of the different use cases uh, that we have uh, analyzed. Uh, you see that we have use cases for emergency calling, use cases for mission critical communications, use cases for PWS systems, public warning systems, and we have added a new domain, which is automated emergency support. And uh, I will give you some examples of some uh, uh, use cases in this domain. Uh, in our report, we have harmonized 
uh, the actors which are involved in the different use cases. On the left, you have the actors from the emergency services. So this is something that is usual, usual in emergency communications. And on the right, we have introduced all the IoT uh, quote-unquote actors, like the platforms and the devices and the applications. And our goal was really to merge both to make a fail-safe operation. First example of the, our use cases. Automatic direct emergency call from IoT device. Um, as an example, in a smart city, you have a, a, a you know there are no uh, trash cans uh, embedded uh, under the road, and uh, they might have some uh, uh, smoke detectors, and the smoke detector de detect actually there is some fire that has started, and so we want to enable the uh, smoke detector to call directly 112. So this is one of the use cases. Um, yeah, I forgot something, is that uh, the smoke detector needs to be fail safe, so it may start uh, a video just to confirm that there is actually some smoke and some, some fire ongoing. I think this is very important. Second use case, Mission critical communications. Um, we have uh, those fi firefighters who have been sent to the to the site, to the emergency site, and they are wear wearing some smart clothing. They are, these clothing are equipped with sensors, and these sensors are able to report to the uh, local uh, um, local officer, which is in in this truck. That oh, no, thank you in this truck that you see here, or to the control center, uh, what is the actual situation of the firefighter inside the building, and for example, uh, some uh, vi vital signs or some temperature. Uh, last one is uh, one of the, these new use cases that we have uh, defined, where you have um, some IoT-based action uh, following PWS message reception. So you have an IoT device that is able to decode a public warning system message and to, to, make, to perform some action like uh, um, uh, turn o turning off a gas pipe, uh, stopping a high-speed train, or preventing uh, uh, an urban rail uh, uh, metro to go uh, to provide to um, to progress uh, towards the coast if there was some tsunami uh, uh, warning, for example. So these are very nice use cases. And then what have we done uh, from these use cases? We have analyzed each of them, and we have seen uh, uh, what were the potential points of failure. And you can find in the report the different point, uh, points of failure. I'm not going to explain them here. Based on this point of failures, we have derived some recommendations for future standards. And uh, we have, as I said, we have uh, added an emergency communication domain, which is the automated emergency response. And we have done our analysis on five no what we call knowledge areas, which are the usage and maintenance, the interoperability, networks and connectivity, the data exchange, which is taking care of service and application levels, and the security. So you see that uh, networks and connectivity is only one part of the analysis we have done. Now I can, again, uh, I will uh, 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 invite you to read our, stand, our document when it is published. It will be publicly available for free. I just give you here some, some of the recommendations that are in, the, in this document. Uh, let's talk now about usage and maintenance. Emergency calling domain. We say that emergency data received from an IoT device should be clear and ambiguous which means that the PSAP should be, should be able to understand the message from the IoT device it has received. In terms of uh, mission-critical communications, if you perform software updates on IoT devices, 
they should be uh, uh, subject to certification process. In terms of public warning system, the configuration of the IoT device should be tested before the start of its operation. This sounds like reasonable, but sometimes it is not, it is forgotten. So we want to put that into standards. I can continue like uh, in automated emergency response. So where you have the IoT device doing some action, you have to be very careful. And so you, you, we, we say that there should be a platform which monitors the status of the IoT device and ensures that it is not uh, um, uh, out, of, out of service. Because if you rely on an IoT device and it is out of service, you will not get the action that you are expecting. Then uh, uh, I give you another example of data exchange at service and application level. For emergency calling domain, we say that uh, uh, the IoT devices should support, uh, uh, involved in that domain, should support the sending of an emergency data message. It sounds normal, but they should not just send the values, they should send the message. Then we have mission critical communication domains. Um, uh, we say that they, they should be able to trigger other IoT devices, as I said before. For example, we have a, sm a smoke detector that turns on a camera just to ensure that we don't have a, a false positive. Uh, then in the public warning system domain, the um, IoT service platform and the t IoT uh, device should uh, identify when they receive a duplicate uh, message and suppress the duplication. In the automated emergency response domain, uh, we, uh, this is very important that we get data interoperability between the emergency control and the IoT devices. Data interoperability is a must and it's uh, very difficult, one of the gaps in, and challenges in IoT. So, as a conclusion, uh, this project, STF555, which was uh, run under the umbrella of uh, SCMTEL, has performed a technical study uh, of the impacts of IoT in emergency situations. We have performed an analysis of the state of the art, and uh, I didn't go into this part here because uh, this is very wide. If you, if you study IoT in emergency situations or emergency in IoT uh, technologies, uh, you have a lot of already a lot, uh, a lot of uh, things to say. Uh, we have uh, defined some uh, example use cases and we have analyzed our potential uh, failures and the impact of these failures. And we have proposed uh, some recommendations of potential requirements for revised and new standards. Um, our recommendations are not applied to some specific standards. They are more applied to some specific communication domains that I've listed previously. Uh, at the end of the report, we have, however, put some uh, concluding remarks where we give further indications for MTEL, which is our main uh, uh, special committee. But we are also doing some recommendation for IoT service platform specification groups. Uh, you may have heard of 1M2M, which is a, a partnership project uh, in which Etsy is involved and who is doing standardization of IoT uh, service platforms. And we have uh, defined some recommendations to uh, network specification groups. So we all think about 3GPP, but uh, we are also considering uh, TCC, which is uh, uh, actually uh, <laughs> linked <laughs> linked with your work, yes. Uh, SES for satellite communications. We have also, uh, they could be also handled by IETF, ITU, IEEE, or even some industrial alliances like Zigbee, Z-Wave, and Loa. Uh, just to finish, our conclusions, uh, we realized that they would mainly apply to uh, standardization body, but they also uh, be very interesting to st system deployment stakeholders because sometimes the, the failure may come from the how the system is deployed. Thank you.
Michelle, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I must say I always admire people who do standards. It's a difficult job and uh, probably more difficult than many other things in the, in, in the chain of, of making new, new things and new devices, but it's the most important job because good standards and Etsy makes good open standards are the basis for everything in the future. I think we have a question, questions, please. As usual, introduce yourself and... Hello. Thank you for the presentation. It was a great one and really related to me. Um, my name is Davor. I have a startup, uh, IoT startup here in Croatia, in Zagreb, for developing IoT devices for emergency situations. And I'm developing that for flood specialist company in UK. And we will test them with environment agency maybe this year. Should be last year, but the funding, to get some really funding is... <laughs> to get we need one year to get something to develop but related to your presentation uh, I don't know on which boot you are and I would talk to you personally um, can you provide the uh, IT startups with uh, specific requirements to how to develop IT devices for emergency situations for example which communication networks would be good for example Sigfox has already uh, security inside that is good but uh, it cannot de deliver more messages than 14 bytes, which is 14 signs. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, I think it's very interesting because it, it is, a, uh, I think it, it is a difference between a, 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 an implementation project and a standardization project. In a standardization project, we don't provide recommendation for selecting uh, uh, this kind of network or, or another type of network. We just say, the network is expected to support this type of, uh, of um, operation. And then it is your role as an implementer. We have tried to avoid uh, re implementation recommendations. It is your role as an implementer to check, uh, based on the, recommend the recommendation of requirements we have made, which, one, which network will be uh, supporting these requirements. We, we cannot, especially, uh, you are talking about Sigfox, uh, it, it is. It is under. It is. It can be discussed by Sigfox is not a standard, and so uh, uh, it, it's completely out of scope of, uh, of our work. We have uh, described anyway in our state of the art uh, all the different networks, and Sigfox appears, but uh, as, at the same as you have uh, Laura or. E uh, and BIOT, but we, we don't, we, it is, we didn't think it was our role to, to say you have to use this, this network instead of uh, that one. We just say the network that you are going to select has to fulfill some requirements. And they, were, they are not even requirements, they are potential requirements because the outcome of our work should be derived into some real standards. We are just made a technical report. Right, thank you, thank you very much. We have other question over there. I'm embarrassed for 999112 um, uh, 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 committee in the UK. Um, one of the big things that we do in the UK is to stop people using the Internet of Things to dial 112 or 999 automatically. We have had multiple issues of devices activating frequently and causing uh, real people to be turned out to a device that was malfunctioning. We will now take active steps to stop somebody doing something unless they have gone through an approvals process that we control. We need an organization to get a sponsor from the emergency services to st who will say that their device works that it will not generate unnecessary deployments and that it will not have a negative impact on the operation of 999 or 112 in the UK. This is very important to us and I would actively encourage anybody considering doing anything in the UK to talk to the 999-112 liaison committee. We will then put you through the vetting process to decide whether you are a fit organization to generate 112 messages automatically, yeah? and whether the technology you're using is reliable. A single car with a, with a, a misfunctioning device in the event of a collision 
on one day generated over 200 calls, which had to be filtered out to stop 200 emergency activations from one device on one day. Yeah? So please, even though it may sound technically a nice thing to do, we've got to be satisfied that this is safe and that it's real and that it will not have a negative effect on our police or our ambulance or on our firefighters in the real world. Well, if, if I may yeah. say a few words also this, after standardization comes certification. Yes, exactly. So Absolutely. you get this, when something is standardized doesn't mean that it can be implemented as is. Then every, you, every organization has the right to apply their own certification procedures and processes. One is verification of the standardization. Another one is interoperability, certification of functioning and other things. Michelle, if you have to add something. Yes, I have, I have a good answer for that. Thank you for this question because this has been raised uh, during the, the, com the review of our document. Uh, we are, it's currently under review. And it's nice also to, 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 co to notice that uh, it has been raised by B British Telecom. So I think it uh, comes from the same source. And uh, this, is the, this is our answer. Our document is just to avoid this type of, of, uh, of event, this type of problem, this type of failure. What we have recommended is that um, first uh, you try to put, you, you don't leave it to one sensor, you, you avoid duplications, you include some certification. So these are just examples of how we have answered to this comment. You, I, I agree with you that you will not put just one IoT device, especially uh, an IoT sensor that is, uh, let's say, uh, manufactured today, which may be faulty, alone, and let it, let it go and call 112. This is just uh, uh, to be avoided. And this is really what we have put in our document, and this is, I think, one of the main outcome and one, one of the main interest of having uh, uh, performed this, this study and this analysis. So I fully agree with you. You don't let just one IoT sensor to call 112. You put either a human or artificially intelligent platform in the middle. You put uh, some... Um, um, so you, you try to correlate several sensors. Uh, for example, uh, you, you have seen one of our recommendations is that uh, the sensor may trigger a camera to double check that the, uh, it has detected some smoke, but there is really a fire ongoing and this kind of thing. And all this is, uh, I think, the interest of the work. Uh, of course, I, I'm positive about our work, but uh, uh, this is one of the interests of the work we have, we have done. So if people follow the recommendations we have uh, made, the, uh, these kind of things will not happen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. Thank you, Michelle. I see no more questions. So once again, thank you for your interesting presentation and for thank hard you. work. <laughs> it's three o'clock and it's right time to complete our, our session today. I want to remind you that uh, in this room, here we have, in five minutes, session related to emergency calls triage. And uh, in the stream number one, you are going to learn how telemedicine and AED can be used to save more lives. So I wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you.